Well, um, how are you guys? <laughs> um, thank you to the Oxford Union uh, and all of you uh, for having us here. Uh, and thank you for coming out on just the average day in England, which is kind of gloomy and rainy and dull and windy. Um, you know, I have a, I have a checklist, uh, a life checklist. Uh, and one of the things on my checklist um, was to come back to Oxford. I read law here many years ago. Uh, I have wonderful memories, old friends in the audience. Um, so to come back to Oxford, check into the Randolph <laughs> with a pretty girl um, and Oxford pays for the Randolph room. <laughs> So uh, thank you, Sarah, for making that happen. Uh, Arundhati and I are both really thrilled um, to be here. Um, and um, we're looking forward um, to this hour with you. Um, we will take 14 minutes now. The joke took a minute. So 14 minutes now, um, to, uh, which will split between the two of us um, to talk about um, this little case that we're all interested in, um, to talk about the future uh, and to talk about this present moment uh, of some political uncertainty uh, and anxiety, not just in our country, uh, not just in our hometown today, uh, which is experiencing great violence, um, but also, I suspect, uh, a global political movement and moment um, and with that as a overall landscape, uh, we will talk about the future of uh, LGBT rights um, in the world's largest constitutional democracy. Right. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for having us. Um, in 2016, Menika and I were part of a group of lawyers. Come back, you can't run away <laughs> after that joke. Uh, we were part of a group of lawyers who filed a petition challenging Section 377, which was the provision under our criminal code that criminalized sodomy. And it made what it called carnal intercourse against the order of nature punishable with either 10 years imprisonment or imprisonment for life. Till that point, the history of the challenge, you know, if you look at the history of the challenge to Section 377, it had begun almost 15 years before we filed that case. And the challenge had already had always been led by either organizations or before the Supreme Court of India, there were groups of parents, of teachers, of mental health professionals, and uh, a member of parliament who Menika represented, who all spoke about the impact that Section 377 had on LGBT people, but there were never LGBT people in court speaking in their own voices about what it meant to live life under a sodomy law. The petition that we filed in 2016 had for the first time gay people filing a challenge to Section 377 in their own names. They were in, 16, in 2016, there were five of them. There was Navtej Singh Johar, the lead petitioner, who was a Bharatanatyam dancer, his partner Sunil Mehra, a journalist, Ritu Dalmia, who's a restauranteur, Aman Nath, the founder of the Nimrana chain of hotels, and finally, Ayesha Kapoor, a businesswoman. So these were five petitioners who came to court, and they, as I said, they were the first LGBT people to file petitions in their own name. But they were at that time in their mid-40s to their early 60s, and they had lived their lives under a sodomy law. So in some ways, they had learned how to shape their aspiration under this umbrella of a criminal law. It took till 2018 for the Supreme Court to issue notice to the government, which meant that it called on the government of India to file a response. And after that, in some ways, the floodgates opened. So then we had petition after petition after petition with lots of LGBT people coming to court and saying that they wanted this law struck down. In 2000. 18 May, we filed a second petition 
on behalf of Keshav Suri, a hotelier, and then a third petition with 20 students and alum of the Indian Institutes of Technology, which are India's leading tech school. And this time, our petitioners were much younger. They were between the age of, I mean, the, the median age was 24. And what really struck us was the sense of aspiration that they had as to what they wanted from their lives. Not only did they want to live life without a criminal law, but they wanted to live in India. They wanted to live wherever they wanted in India, not to have to choose life in metropolitan centers where their sexuality might find greater acceptance, um, not to have to choose jobs in fields that they thought were more liberal, where their sexuality might again find greater acceptance. But most importantly for what, I'm, what we're talking about today, they wanted to be able to have the relationships that they felt they were entitled to and that they aspired to in India. They didn't want to have to think about life outside of the country if they wanted to get married. They didn't want to have to think about life outside of the country if they wanted something as simple as insurance for their partners or to have their partner's name on their passport. And they were already thinking about marriage. So when we filed this case before the Supreme Court in 2016, the foundation for what we asked for was not simply that the court decriminalize sodomy. There is a long chain of judgments that the Supreme Court has passed and a jurisprudence that it has developed to say that it will protect couples, it will protect relationships, even when those relationships go against the societal norm, even when they go against what society thinks it's, or who society thinks it's okay for you to love. So there were interfaith couples who had approached the court. There were intercaste couples who approached the court. These were couples who had come to court even when their parents were unhappy with their relationships and perhaps had filed criminal complaints against them. These were couples who came to court even when their communities were unhappy. And in some cases, there may have been khap panchayats, which are groups of the village, which together decide that these are relationships which are socially unacceptable. And in each of these cases, the court said, that the constitutional vision of Indian society as a society which will break down caste norms, which will protect its minorities, and a society which is diverse and vibrant because it recognizes that India is a multicultural and multi-faith society. This constitutional vision gives the court a duty to protect couples who may defy a social norm. And we went to court, and the court this time in 2018, in September, a five-judge bench of the Indian Supreme Court agreed with us to say that the Constitution protects a right to choose your partner. What we hope for for the future, and, and Menika is going to expand on this, but what we hope for the future is that this right to choose your partner will include the right for LGBT couples to marry. Yeah. Um, the marriage project, right? Um, you know, the, the, maybe the history of the law, if you wanted a, a one way of imagining and understanding the law. Uh, so much of the history of the law has been about policing love, right? Whether it's interracial relationships, a case called Loving versus Virginia sorted that out only in the 1960s in America. Uh, whether it's inter-caste relationships, the history of my country is about prohibiting that, um, and the constitutional project is about remedying the disadvantage of caste. The court's project has been about enabling inter-religious and inter-caste marriages. And that has been a project of contemporary modern constitutional India. But that has not been the norm of the social, religious, and civilizational India as we understand it. So part of this is that same-sex relationships are now located in that constitutional, moral, and legal arc. Um, and that is the next challenge. Um, that is going forward, um, the, constitutional, um, the constitutional compact that we want extended to LGBT Indians as well. So, in the words of the Chief Justice, then Deepak Mishra, who, who writes 
uh, the leap judgment in the case that is Navtet Singh Johar, which decriminalized homosexuality. Uh, he says, well, if five to seven percent of the population of India um, are LGBT Indians, uh, then for this five to seven percent of population, we expect these values of non-discrimination, equality, freedom of expression, um, and freedom of self-determination. Uh, the Constitution protects to be extended to them as well. So that's the first thing. The second part of this project is why marriage, right? Um, now there's a legal answer to that, and there is a social answer to that. What is the legal answer to that? The legal system in India and in most countries anywhere in the world is premised on a bundle of rights that recognizes our personhood. Now, we may agree or disagree with it, but that bundle of rights, who do I leave my home to? Who do I nominate for life insurance? Um, who do I have as a co-signee on a lease? Uh, can I buy Arundhati medical insurance? No, I cannot. Um, so the legal system, can I open a joint bank account? Uh, can I avoid paying estate taxes if I leave my little home uh, to her? I hope she'll leave her larger home to me. Uh, <laughs> but all of this, seriously, all of this is premised on one thing, blood relationship. And blood relationship is not just child and a parent. Blood relationship is that of marriage, a spousal relationship. So that's one part of it. So if you want to be part of the legal project of rights, civil liberties, protections, then you either have to be born to someone or you have to be married to someone. Now we can have a deeper conversation on whether that is right or wrong, but the, the reality, the legal reality, is that either you are recognized by the law to be part of that personhood or you are not. And unfortunately, all legal systems across the world are premised on this understanding of the law. That's the first part of it. The second part, and that is also a very important part, is the social project that is marriage. Now, the world is divided into different kinds of countries, right? You have countries with good weather and bad weather. You have countries with good food and bad food. <laughs> but you also have the global north and the global south. Well, here's the thing about the global south, and here's the thing about South Asia, and here's the thing about my country, India. We are a marriage country. So our relationships, Young woman um, called me up shortly after the judgment, and she's a very well-known Indian. Um, and she uh, is dating someone. She's very prominent. Um, and she's come out on national TV. Um, and she said one thing. I am in a relationship with my partner. Uh, but what name do I give this relationship? Because we are not a country that recognizes girlfriends and boyfriends or dating. We are a country that sanctifies one kind of relationship, and that is marriage. The modernity that defines India, that is coming to India, the aspirations of material you know, betterment, and, and uh, all of that aside, young people in India, gay or straight, different religions, different castes, different classes, when you speak to them, they all aspire for one thing in common, which is a long-term partnership, which is premised on marriage. And what we find um, with younger gay people in India is that they want to be part of that social and legal project as well. And that is what we have learned from our clients, our younger clients. Part of those aspirations of occupational success includes the aspiration of personal happiness and a core part of that personal happiness that they see for the rest of their lives is having someone to love that the law recognizes that they can in turn take home to their families. Now you can critique that as well, but the reality is, is that we are a kin-based society. We are a family society. And one of the biggest gains of this judgment have been the number of parents who've met us, the number of parents who've had 
their children introduce their partners to them after the judgment. The number of parents who have now embraced their same sex, uh, I, I want to say the, the partner of their child who happens to be same sex, into their families. We are not simply a family society, we are also a marriage society and we are also a people of 1.7 billion people who are deeply enmeshed in a social fabric where one of the biggest determiners of that social fabric is marriage and family. So in that country, whether we are called the global south, whether we are called the world's largest constitutional democracy, whether we are called a secular country, the reality of that country is that gay people and straight people and left-handed people and right-handed people all aspire for one thing in common, to find love. And for many who find love, they also aspire to have the law and society recognize, protect, affirm, and give legitimacy to that love. One way of doing that is marriage. And that is what we're here to talk about today, the marriage project that is the future of LGBT rights in the world's largest constitutional democracy. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here today. We're all incredibly honored that, that you've chosen to speak to us. I wanted to start by asking about, as you mentioned, the marriage project, which um, you'd like to focus on. How are you starting to tackle this challenge? Because it's so immense. There's, I would imagine there's levels to legal, cultural, social. What, what's sort of your starting point with that? I think some of it has already happened. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that was very surprising to us and which we've been um, you know, really happy to see is how quickly after decriminalization in 2018, how quickly society seems to have moved next to this demand for marriage or conversation about marriage from gay people. So, um, you know, there's uh, yesterday evening a new film that's released, which is about two young men and thinking about, you know, what happens if one of them is, a, you know, two young men who are together and what happens if one of them is being forced into an arranged marriage with a woman. Um, Duti Chand, who is uh, India's fastest woman, she's a sprinter, has a newspaper interview about her partner when she came out last year after the 2018 Supreme Court judgment. And she's also said that, you know, I want to be able to marry my partner. So in some ways, I think, you know, India's young people are deeply aspirational and they're also perhaps ahead of us and, you know, ahead of the, ge the generation that was before them. Um, in that, after decriminalization, they have already very spontaneously started this demand for marriage. You know, the last thing I'll say is that there's already a case that's been filed in one of our high courts in Kerala by two young men who went to a temple in, uh, in Kerala, performed a marriage ceremony, and are now asking the state to recognize their marriage uh, under the civil law of marriage. So it, the project has already started. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Always says it better than me. <laughs> and going back to the 2018 case, in 2013, the case was taken to the Supreme Court, but the law was upheld. Yeah. Um, what changed in the 2018 case that yeah. you think made it so that the law was overturned and how much of an impact did the young petitioners that you mentioned have yeah. on this change? It's a good question. Um, so in 2013, um, the Indian Supreme Court, a smaller panel of judges, so our court doesn't sit on bank, it sits in panels of judges. Um, so a smaller panel of judges uh, upheld the law. Um, and we, we were always struck by one question that the justice, the senior justice in that court um, had for all of us in that courtroom, um, where he looks at the government lawyer um, and says, uh, Mr. Malotra, do you know any homosexuals? Um, and that to us was a real um, insight 
because it was that classic situation of one, clearly the judge himself didn't know any homosexuals. Uh, the law officer, Mr. Malhotra, didn't know any homosexuals. He, he, he replied to that question by laughing and saying, I'm not that modern, my lords. Um, but to us, it was a real insight, which is that um, the court seemingly didn't know any homosexuals. Um, because in as much as they had been very courageous, consistent, brave um, litigation, which involved organizations and parents and psychiatrists and members of parliament and just all fine, fine people represented by extraordinary lawyers who had given this battle decades of their life and extraordinary activists who had mobilized communities. Um, that, that way of actually bringing to life who this unknown community is, who this unknown Indian is, that queer Indian, who is this person, clearly we had not been able to explain that to the judge. Um, courtrooms are very much um, little rooms of theater. You know, courtrooms are storytelling opportunities. Courtrooms are theatrical, in a sense. Um, to do good theater, to tell a powerful story, you need compelling protagonists. And there is no protagonist greater than a citizen of a country going to her court and saying, this is my country too. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is who I love. And I would like my constitution back. That is what having gay petitioners enables you to do. As lawyers, we are only as good as the stories that we are tasked with telling. And that is why for every courtroom today, when LGBT Indians will go to court, and they will do so, they will not just do so for marriage, they will do so for employment discrimination, they will do so for civil rights, they will do so for other constitutional rights, they will go in their own names and they will let other lawyers tell their story. And that is what will bring legal change to the courts. And you mentioned in your address that you talked about the distinction between legal realities and what we morally believe to be right and wrong. What was it like to argue against people who believed that the sodomy law shouldn't be overturned? Yeah. You know, it's very interesting because some of, the, some, some of my colleagues at the bar argued against us, uh, more so in 2013 and then again in 2018. Um, and, um, you know, it's an extraordinary thing because as lawyers, you're trained not to take things personally. You know, there is detachment is taught in law school. Um, you could argue that the other side of detachment is status quoism, you know, and we can have a different conversation about, you know, whether the law is status quoist or not, and it is, right? Um, but it is very hard to be detached when these, these are your lives that are being discussed in a courtroom as if you don't exist. Um, and, and, and what we learned and what I learned from that moment is this is what it feels to be a litigant. Um, and, and that is also why it is important for more gay people to go to law school. That is also why it is more important for more Dalits to go to law school, more women to go to law school, more Muslims to go to law schools, because it is through that diversity um, that we will have different kinds of storytelling, that the law will learn to reflect the country that it is meant to speak for. And today, arguably, our judiciaries and our legal professions do not reflect the diversity of India. And that is a failing. Um, so until our legal classrooms begin to reflect the country that is India, that is with its diversity of religion and ethnicity and ca class and caste and sexuality and gender, the law will remain foreign to the country it governs. And did you have a chance to connect with the, the lawyers on the opposite side of the case post the 2018 judgment? and? sort of what was that like and what was their reaction? You know, I mean, we're lawyers, right? We're professionals. We, we meet um, lawyers who disagree with us and litigants who disagree with us. And, you know, that's part of, uh, you know, we sit and have tea with them after cases, uh, once the case is done. But I think the, you know, the, the broader point, if I take from your question, 
is that there is always um, a social group or a line of thinking or a philosophy that you may disagree with, right? And when you're litigating in an adversarial system, then there's always someone on the other side who is putting forward the opposite case that you're putting. Um, but the point that comes through in the Johar judgment from 2018 and other cases of that time is that even when social morality uh, takes a certain point of view and it may reflect majoritarian thinking, the constitution embeds a certain set of values, right? And constitutional morality speaks to values of equality, of dignity, of fraternity. It protects fundamental rights. And those values will trump social values every time. So that's really the bedrock of the court's thinking at that moment. Um, and really, that's where the conflict lies. Um, you know, for us as individual lawyers, uh, when we fight um, social rights cases, there's always an opposition, but it's really the conflict between these two values, social morality on the one side and constitutional morality on the other, um, that, that brings that tension to bear. You also mentioned that this has been, decades of work have been put into this case. Looking back, what are the biggest challenges that you see as standing out throughout all the work? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I think of of, of the time of the early rounds of litigation before the Delhi High Court, you know, in the early 2000s when it started. And I can only imagine um, 20, 25 years ago, um, just, you know, I can only imagine how hard it was to put those cases into place. Um, and I think that, you know, um, 20 years from today, there will be other lawyers and other activists reflecting on this, on, the, on this moment and these times and the choices that are being made. Um, I think the biggest challenges really are the ability for activists and lawyers to think of new strategies, um, not just necessarily when you've lost, but also when you've won, right? So I think it is the ability to very quickly recognize, recognize changing um, social science, political times, um, and to be able to address those changing social, political, legal times with different strategies. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes think of ourselves as, as, as being athletes, you know, in the sense that um, you have to adapt your game um, you have to change, um, you know, with your opponents. You also have to change your game as you get older. Um, and some of it is that, that some of it is that as LGBT litigation uh, isn't as young as it, as it now is, as it becomes middle-aged and as it gets older, what are those changing strategies going to look like? Um, so I think, like for every professional, I think for legal professional also, our challenges are not to keep doing what we were doing, but our challenges are to look outside and to change our strategy. That creativity, I think, is what must come uh, in challenging times. And based on that, what are the biggest challenges within the evolving social and political landscape in India that you anticipate for, for the marriage project? You know, and that's a simple question, Sarah. You know. um, look, I think that there are a lot of challenges, right? And there is also, there are already a lot of bridges. You know, I think that um, one, obviously there is, there is this, there is often going to be this kind of um, juxtapositioning of, you know, constitutional litigation, social morality, social values. I think what has been interesting is um, how quickly there has been the, an articulation of the desire to get married by young people. And that is, to me, that is what has been striking. And to me, that is going to be the bridge because they are going to propel that agenda by simply living their lives, taking their partners to their parents, and by also going to court. And that is what they're already doing. Um, so I think that in many ways, it is also going to take 
the political class now uh, the maturity to recognize that this five to seven percent of the Indian population, which amounts to, you know, I'm not a good mathematician, but that's about 90 to 110 million people, whichever way you look at it, um, 90 to 110 million people is about 60, 70 million voting Indians. That is a lot. That is bigger than many European countries, right? Uh, speaking of voting. Um, <laughs> sorry, but you know, uh, you know, but so, so these are going to be voting Indians. Um, and so for so long, they have been invisible. Now they are not so invisible. Now they're going to be in courts. Now they're going to be in political parties and this is already happening. Um, and you are going to need to speak to them. And are you going to tell 60, 70 million voting Indians that we will discriminate? And then looking at the impact of the case internationally, what effect have you seen it have on people fighting for LGBTQ plus rights in other countries? Yeah, I think, you know, the reality is that India had a sodomy law as part of its history of colonization, right? And um, the sodomy law found place in the Indian Penal Code uh, because similar laws were enforced at that time in Britain uh, with even harsher punishments. And, um, and the Indian Penal Code was this sort of experiment uh, first introduced in India as a British colony in codifying and writing down and bringing into statute uh, what the British government thought should be criminal law for India. And um, after which, because that experiment was thought to be successful, similar provisions spread throughout uh, the British colonial world. So today you have challenges in, um, you know, in Singapore, in Kenya, um, and in, in many countries where, you know, activists in the post-colonial world are challenging similar provisions. Um, and some of those are on ongoing court cases, some of those are active um, in Mauritius as well, that petition has been filed. And all of these, uh, you know, this entire struggle is sort of rooted in this history of British colonialism. Um, I think the, the Indian Supreme Court, right, um, one, of course, it's a large and expansive judgment which speaks very emphatically for constitutional rights, but um, the difference in the impact of a judgment from the Indian Supreme Court as opposed to, say, courts in Western democracies is that the social and cultural fabric of countries in the global south seems to be similar. So when there is this, um, you know, easy criticism of LGBT rights as being a Western import or a Western idea, the fact that the Indian Supreme Court speaks to LGBT rights from within the tensions of the Indian social fabric um, means that that judgment can be taken on board by constitutional courts in countries like Kenya, Singapore, um, now you know, a challenge in Mauritius, um, and of course, those are constitutional courts of their own countries, and they must decide these cases, and they do decide these cases um, based on their own jurisprudence and their own understanding of the constitution and their societies. Um, but hopefully, this will be, you know, this judgment can be considered by them because these tensions that the courts consider are the same. Yeah. Thank you. And then my final question before opening up to the audience is, on a slightly more personal note, why, what made both of you decide to become lawyers? And why did you want to go into this profession? Um, I did have uh, one other gig that I thought I'd do instead of being a lawyer. Um, I, I, I was 13 or 14 and I wanted to um, be a backup singer for Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, my cousins, you know, uh, said to me something very important. They said, but you don't have the talent. <laughs> so when my mom suggested, why not the law? Uh, uh, for a talentless singer, it sounded pretty good. 
Um, you know, I, 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 I love the law. I, I have no other way of saying this. You know, I, I love different facets of it. It's not just about constitutional litigation. I love commercial law, criminal law. I just find it deeply fascinating. I love that you have to go back and examine something and you use your examination to tell a story. I love that about it. Um, it is uh, a decision that in India you make when you're quite young, when you're 17 and a half. Um, it is the best decision professionally I have ever made to commit to being a lawyer. Um, and I think um, it affords you the ability to not just have an interesting life, um, but I think it affords you the ability of addressing the things that piss you off and doing so through formal chat, you know, channels. Um, so it's not just about, you know, is this authority legitimate? It's also about the opportunity of explaining why it is illegitimate. And I think um, for a kid with no singing talent, you know, it's just a different kind of crooning that it lets you do. So, um, you know, I, when I decided to become a litigator, it was for the very noble reason that I thought, you know, it allows you to bring about social change. The law can be a powerful instrument for that. Um, I think, you know, the reality of legal practice is that you spend long hours drafting things and someone tears them up and then you go back to the drawing board. Um, you're in courts and sometimes, you know, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis can be quite mundane. Um, but what I, what I like about it is that that promise came true in some ways, that it's a very practical, tangible way of making a change. Um, you know, it, it might be in the life of an individual or it could be on a much broader level. Um, but uh, one, you know, Menika and I, Menika is a QC, I'm a barrister. And um, what I, I also really like standing up in court to argue cases. And I think part of the reason for that is that, um, you know, as women, we're not supposed to perform. We're not supposed to, uh, you know, ha want all the attention um, to really be, you know, making decisions. And the buck stops with you when you're arguing, you know, you win or you lose. Uh, but you win or you lose. There's really nobody else uh, to, uh, you know, pass the blame on to or, or the bouquets to when, when you win. And uh, in some, you know, it, it's like a, a game or theater, as Menika said, and, and you have to be that actor. You know, you have to step up and take that role and take it on and it's a lot of responsibility and I don't think that's how society teaches, um, you know, it was not my experience of what society taught me to be as a woman, um, to take decisions, to take responsibility, to say that, you know, the, the buck will stop with me and that the entire sort of game is about you in some ways when you're a barrister. Um, and, and that's something which I've really learned to enjoy. It's not always been easy. Um, it's not always been instinctive, but I think it really sort of makes you need to practice being big in a certain way, and, and it's, um, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll move to questions from the audience now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and then please stand up while asking your question. And could we start with the member in the back? Hiya, um, I just wanted to ask what you both think the time scale is in terms of gay marriage being a reality in India because it's a question that I often ask myself in a conversation that I have with my sister and neither me or her can imagine this happening like within our lifetimes. I was wondering what you both thought about the time scale for gay marriage in India. Thank you. Well, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to jinx this. <laughs> uh, but I urge you and your sister to start being more optimistic about what you can imagine in your lifetime. Um, but, um, you know, I think this is a journey um, that we're going to have to make together um, with the courts, um, with the legislature, uh, with clients, uh, with gay people. Um, you know, so I, d I don't want to put a number on it, um, but I am extremely confident, given that I'm so much older than you. 
I am extremely confident uh, of seeing this in my lifetime, um, and really, when I can walk unassisted. So, quite quickly, I'm hoping. Yeah. Thank you. Could we go to the member in the first row? At the end of the first row over there. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Hi, uh, hi this is uh, Rahul Bajaj. I'm an MPhil in law student here. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Guru Swami. Um, so, uh, I'll give you a personal example. So, so, in January 2019, the Indian Supreme Court delivered a verdict to say that if you are blind, it's okay for there to be a rule uh, to the effect that you cannot be a judge in India. Mm. Um, uh, you may be familiar with that case. And as yeah. someone uh, who is visually challenged, uh, I, I was uh, very angry about the verdict. Uh, and you spoke about how the law is an instrument to work on what pisses you off. Yeah. Now, you cannot go to a court and say to the judge, this is not OK, you ableist pig, right? <laughs> so, so how do you then constructively channel your anger um, on an issue that impacts you so deeply on right. a personal level. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that question, Rahul. And it's really nice to finally meet. You know, um, uh, you know, it's wonderful to meet. And I just want you to know, firstly, that uh, you inspire so many of us. Right. Um, I think you are right to be deeply pissed off uh, at that judgment. Um, uh, you know, it is not just you who should be pissed off. I think we should all be pissed off. Um, and I think that the way to challenge it is to do exactly that, to go to that judge and say, this is who I am and this is my life and your judgment is, you know, deeply problematic. Um, I think that judges will often get things right, will also sometimes get things terribly wrong. Um, and the challenge really is to remedy that wrong, right? Um, so I think, one, we must challenge it. If you would like to challenge it, let's go to court. Um, uh, and I am happy to help in any which way um, uh, to, have, to, to make that happen. And two, I think if you want to be a judge, then I think you would probably make a very fine judge. Um, so I urge you to challenge what is a deeply flawed uh, decision. Could we go to the member in the third row? Over the, the third row, that. Hi, my name is Claudia. I'm studying law here, and I'm from Kenya. And uh, my question to both of you is, what would you tell um, people from countries like Kenya where the decision to decriminalize homosexuality is really always used as a political campaign tool? and it's, and also the judiciary is not independent. So in as much as activists want to keep going, it's also hard for them to keep going when yeah. they know for sure that this will always be a political campaign too. Thank you. And I really admire your work. I'm just going to have to say that. <laughs> do you want me to take, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think there are two things, right? One, legal change happens inside and outside courtrooms around court cases, right? So litigation doesn't happen in a vacuum. And um, it, it is a challenge when that opposition, I mean, it's a double, you know, doubly impacted challenge when that opposition comes from inside the courtroom and outside the courtroom. Um, but equally, the challenge then is to bring that conversation, you know, as to what is happening inside court um, outside court as well. And, and that is why having LGBT people going to court directly um, is so important and so powerful to move from organizations being the principal litigators to really having people speaking in their own voices because they speak inside court and outside court. You know, they, they in turn speak in their families, in their communities, and that's how that ripple of social change happens. And it is a, you know, it is a struggle and a long battle in all our countries. So it has been a long journey in India. And um, 2013 was, you know, when we lost, it was a, it was a dark night for us and for 
the LGBT community in India. And it was a point in time when, um, you know, we were personally despondent. And um, it, it, the, the, I think the, the important thing is to have faith in institutions and a constitution that protects rights and to have the faith to go back to the same institution hoping and expecting that it will be able to right its own wrongs. You know, that, that is really where that faith in the constitutional project comes from. Could we go to the member in the first row? This question ties back to the conversation that Rahul started and we had about the timeline. And you'd mentioned that, that being a barrister means that there has to be some strategy at play. Given that recently the Supreme Court has been you know, mired with controversies of failing justice within its own ranks, do you feel that it's also a time game of waiting till we change who's uh, the one that decides which benches are formed and that could be the future which will make more progressive judgments come out or do you think it's just about bringing the best case we can? You know, you know it's, I, I think, I, you know, I think I want to also say that um, I don't bench hunt, right? I've never benched hunt, um, hunted, firstly. Secondly, I think you must understand that, you know, for instance, you know, there, there are cases being filed right now. Um, and, and this is not just on gay rights. This is across the board, right? Um, there are folks who, you know, want to move on with their lives in, in more ways than one. Um, and they will go to court. And they will find young, motivated lawyers who take their cases to court. So this idea that all litigation is somehow shaped and defined only around the Supreme Court um, is not, I think, the way these social values cases are going to play out. Um, you will see them coming from lower courts. You will see them coming to the Supreme Court after many years of litigation. So, so I think that that imagination of where litigation happens and which judiciary also needs to change. Um, you know, in the week before I came to, um, uh, before I came here, before this weekend, um, you know, I was in Aurangabad. Uh, before that, I was in Bombay. Um, uh, weeks before that, I was in uh, Chhattisgarh. Um, these are all um, high courts or benches of high courts, and there is an enormous amount of law that's happening there. Uh, there are vast numbers of young lawyers who, are, who come from non-traditional lawyer families, first generation lawyers, um, who are going to court, women going to court. Um, you know, and, and, and these, these things are very, very important because one, they will change the nature of the judiciary. Who becomes a judge? And I hope Rahul will also be part of that change, right? Uh, but secondly, you know, it is important to change our imagination of what is the primary legal site. The primary legal site cannot just be the top court of your country. It has to be the court that is closest to you. And I think that is the big change that is happening in India right now. I see, I'm, I'm going to just, you know, add to that and also answer it slightly differently. I don't think there's ever a time when you can say that I'm going to wait, you know. Um, uh, societies go through phases. Today, globally, we are going through a phase of great um, conservatism. Um, courts go through phases. Um, you know, that there's, there's a lot of wonderful work, for instance, about different phases of the history of the American Supreme Court, by way of example. Um, and societies go through phases. But at no point can we say that I will abandon my hope in an institution and, you know, and, and wait for a rosier time uh, when rights can be agitated. If anything, it is at those moments that we must assert our faith in constitutional values and really to keep going back to those institutions because they also grow and change with us and through the cases that they see coming before them. So I, I wouldn't agree with you there, even when it comes to the Supreme Court. Could we go to the member oh, right at the end of the second row? Thank you so much for your donations as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, 
I was just wondering, uh, given the state of India today and the kind of attack that some of the constitutional values uh, are under, um, do you think there's a particular conversation or approach or kind of an educational idea that would be worthwhile championing to kind of, you know, ch you know, challenge these kind of discriminatory things that are in that society? Um, and especially given the light of today, like what kinds of action would you encourage in a conversational educational sense? I mean, part of it is, is you know, um, you are all part of that project, right? In each of your own countries, and each of our own countries. Uh, part of it is, um, you know, and it's a larger conversation, right? Part of it is, ha you know, do we have these conversations? Do we have these discussions in a way that we are able to actually um, tell simpler stories of constitutionalism and constitutional values? Um, and I say this because, you know, when I think of the Constitution Project in India, right, um, so much of it, uh, the language of the courts is English, uh, the language of most uh, legal texts and treatises are English. Um, and then this is a country where most readers and most conversations are not held in English, right? So part of it is what are we engaging? And who are we engaging? And who are we learning from? You know, um, do we have these conversations in other languages? Do we have it in Hindi? Do we have it in Telugu? Because when you start having those conversations, you would be surprised uh, by who meets you halfway. Um, so part of it is the nature of elite institutions that we're all, you know, in this room, you're all educated in. Uh, and there is something in these elite institutions which takes away our ability to have kind of, you know, real interactions uh, with people across sections, right, who may actually have much more to say uh, for each of us to grow. So part of it is that, that, you know, uh, we have ceded the political space um, to folks who tell very simple stories. We have ceded the legal space uh, to folks who are often status quo. We have ceded the social space to morality truth tellers. Uh, and we have ceded the family spaces um, to folks who are older than us. The question really is, is that if we are able to look away from our gadgets, and if we are able to just hold our thoughts and have simpler, less, uh, um, pompous conversations uh, with folks who may be like us, but folks who may also be not like us, then that is how, you know, you have bridges that are built in society. One of the biggest things I think I have learned um, from being gay is simply this, that these are journeys that not just that you make, but these are journeys that our families make. These are journeys that people who disagree with us make. And these are journeys that we make collectively. You cannot go on a march by yourself. You have to take people with you. And if you want to take people with you, you have to be able to talk to them in ways that there is some resonance. Um, so for me, you know, part of that project is I now read in different languages. Andati has been doing this way before. Um, as I always say, she is far superior to me in most ways. Um, but really, so now I read in different languages. Uh, I try to go to different parts of the country. I visit and I litigate cases in other high courts. Um, I have conversations with people who disagree with me, who I disagree with. We have to build those bridges. If we do not build those bridges, we are talking to echo chambers and we will vote in echo chambers and we will socialize in echo chambers, and we will have relationships in those echo chambers. Thank you. Could we go to the member at the end of the second row? Um, hello, firstly, thank you for being here and being like one of the few examples that I think aspiring lawyers in young India have to actually look at as inspiration. Um, so my question is kind of about this distinction you made between a legal morality and a social morality. And definitely in a country like India, 
an overturning in the, in the former doesn't result in one in the latter. So I wonder if there's conversations happening in the legal community where there's this impetus that should be imposed on the court to move away from just this negative action where it's like, okay, we're gonna decriminalize sodomy and we're going to decriminalize same-sex marriage to actually take some kind of positive action where it's like the duty of the court to firstly protect that right to choose whoever you want to love and also promote that right within like the interiors of the country especially. I think in some ways, you know, what's interesting about the Indian courts is that they are tasked with this challenge of social transformation, right? So it's a constitution that imagines a new society at this historical moment of partition. Um, you know, it's, it's a constitution that imagines a society um, that will protect minorities at a time when the country is being torn apart uh, and a constitution that says that there will be reparations for caste inequality uh, after centuries of that inequality really being deeply embedded uh, in all parts of the social fabric across uh, religious communities in South Asia. Right? So it's a constitution, um, and, and the Indian constitution is a constitution that really imagines a society that is different. And how is that society going to come about? Because the courts will stand um, as one of the key agents of bringing about that vision of social transformation. Um, so when, when you look at the self-imagination of the Indian Supreme Court, it's not limited um, to a vision of uh, negative equality or of saying that, you know, we can uh, go this far and not further. It's really a court uh, that has acted time and again to protect minorities, to protect couples who are challenging um, the social status quo. And we are hopeful that when it comes to marriage, the court will do so also, as, as it's now being called upon to do so in Kerala. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Could we go to the member in the third row over here? Hi. Um, I think uh, the case in India and a lot of the movements to repeal this act around the world are like uh, operating against a backdrop of activism. So what will you say to a country where such an activism doesn't exist or like is constantly struck down because of uh, the conservative societies? Yeah. No, I think that's a good question. Um, and I think that, you know, um, activism, social and legal change, you know, operate in a, spe in, in, in a vast, diverse spectrum. Um, I think it's extremely difficult um, in some countries where there's a lot of repression and it is, you know, it has more room to bloom in countries where there is less repression. Um, you know, it is just difficult. It is sometimes very difficult to build um, court cases in deeply repressive regimes um, and in regimes where you know, where there is a lot of political um, violence that is unleashed um, against activists uh, of different kinds. And, and, you know, I think you can see that because it, there has been a pushback um, against social movements, there's been a pushback against gay rights. You can see that in Russia, for instance, um, under Putin's regime, uh, where there's been a passage of laws uh, on homosexuality. But of course, there's also been a passage of laws on all kinds of political expression um, in, in Russia. Um, I noticed that Pussy Riot ca canceled their appearance here at the Oxford Union. Um, I can only imagine um, the reasons for that. So I think in countries like this, um, it is extremely difficult. And what we learn from this difficulty in, in countries like India, where we have taken political space for granted, and where we believe the right to dissent is protected by the Constitution. What we learn from cases like Russia 
uh, at the, is that we must never become that. And we must never enable a leader who displays those propensities um, to govern our lives. Um, so, you know, since this is the last question, I, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, you know, we woke up to the news um, that today in Delhi there's enormous violence um, that is being caused by protests and counter-protests, those in support of and those opposed to um, the Citizenship Amendment Act. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that is uh, a pathway to citizenship from certain countries uh, only for people from certain religions. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Delhi. It is my home. Um, it is a city that is not just the capital of contemporary India, but it has been the capital of an old civilization. Uh, we now have to learn, um, you know, we must at this moment, I think one, you know, we are worried about that violence, but two, we also have to learn from our history. Um, uh, and our history is one of partition. Our history is one which the Prime Minister, the first Prime Minister of India, when, when speaking to the Constituent Assembly for the first time in Hindi says, um, and I'll translate it, he says, you know, our streets uh, are full of blood. We have come from blood. And we must be very careful not to go back to being streets full of blood, right? So as we speak at this moment of optimism in the context of gay rights, I also speak at a moment of great fear for my country um, that we will go back to being streets full of blood. Um, so to all activists, I think, and all citizens who live in difficult times, um, to our comrades and our colleagues who are battling not just sodomy laws in their own countries, but who are battling repressive regimes, uh, the lack of space. Um, all I can say is that, you know, we stand with you. We stand together. Um, and freedom does not exist in silos. Freedom is a composite project where we are all mutually strengthened by each other's freedom and we are all weakened by each other's losses and despairs. Um, so to my friends and my comrades in Kenya, and we've met them, um, we stand with you. To our friends in uh, Mauritius in Malaysia. and Malaysia and Singapore, um, you are in our hearts because my freedom is not separate from yours. Um, it is only meaningful when we are all free together. Um, to religious minorities in India, you know, we stand committed to the idea of a secular constitutional democracy of equal citizenship because my citizenship is only meaningful when yours is equal to mine and mine is equal to yours. That is the fraternal project. That is my country. Uh, and to my home in Delhi and, and the town that both Arundhati and I grew up in and that we work in, that we live in, that our families live in, um, we, you know, we are fearful for our city. So today, you know, this is bittersweet for us. I come home to uh, a school where I spent many happy years, but I also feel very far away from the town I grew up in. So we'll end with that. <laughs>